Questions to Prime Minister. I start with John Stevenson. Come on, great man. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, today marks five years since this country voted to leave the European Union. It has allowed us to take back control of the issues that matter to the people of the United Kingdom. It has given us the freedom to establish eight free ports across the country, driving new investment, to develop the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, to protect and invest in jobs and renewal across every part of the UK, to control our immigration system and to sign a historic trade deal with Australia. It will allow us to shape a better future for our people. Mr Speaker, over 5.6 million EU citizens have already applied to our EU settlement scheme, and I would encourage anyone who may still be eligible to apply ahead of the deadline next week. Mr Speaker, this week is Armed Forces Week, and I'm sure colleagues from across the House will wish to join me in thanking our fantastic armed forces and their families uh, for their service to our country. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Prime Minister, we are to host COP26. Our goal is net zero by 2050. To achieve that target will require innovative policies, and a free market approach would help. Therefore, if we, are to be, if we were to make solar panels compulsory for all new residential builds, we immediately create a large market. It will lead to innovation, lower prices, job creation, and contribute towards our 2050 target. Will the Prime Minister support such a policy initiative? Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend makes a very interesting uh, suggestion, uh, which I will certainly look into, though uh, I should caution that some homes do not have enough space on their roof or indeed have their roofs angled uh, in the right way uh, to make solar panels viable. But what we are already doing is tightening our standards to ensure that new homes produce at least 75 per cent lower CO2 emissions uh, compared to current standards on our way to net zero by 2050. Let's go to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Why, under this Government, has the number of rape convictions and prosecutions fallen to a record low? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, one of the first things I said when I came to this dispatch box as Prime Minister uh, was that I thought that rape prosecutions and convictions uh, were too low, and that's why we have the end-to-end rape review, and that's why we've been investing in, uh, in independent sexual violence advisors and uh, independent domestic violence advisors, another 27 million. Uh, that's why we've been investing more in the Crime Prosecution Service, another 85 million people. We're also dealing with the misery experienced by uh, rape uh, victims and survivors who have to hand over their mobile phones, Mr. Speaker, which I think has been one of the evidential problems that has arisen in prosecuting, uh, in prosecuting rape cases. But what we've also been doing, Mr. Speaker, is imposing tougher sentences for serious sexual and violent offences. And it would have been good to have some support in that from the right honourable gentleman and the, bench- and the benches opposite. Mr Speaker, we all agree that the figures are appalling. The question is why. The Government's own review makes clear that rape convictions and prosecutions have halved since 2016. Halved. We know that's nothing to do with the pandemic because this is a five-year trend. We know it isn't because there are fewer rape cases being reported because that number's gone up significantly. So let me return to the question that the Prime Minister hasn't answered. Why does the Prime Minister think that rape prosecutions and convictions have plummeted on his watch? Prime Minister. Because, uh, Mr Speaker, as he knows very well, because he has some experience of this matter, there are considerable evidential problems, uh, particularly in, re- in recovering data from mobile phones, and that has been an obstacle uh, to, the, to the speedy preparation of cases. And too often, let's be frank, too often cases go from the police uh, to the Crime Prosecution Service, not in a fit state, and too often those cases are not in a fit state when they come to court. And, and there is not a good enough join up, Mr. Speaker, across the criminal justice system. And, we are, and, and that, is exactly, that is exactly what we are addressing, Mr. Speaker, now by our investments uh, with our end to end rape review. And what, would, and what would be good, Mr. Speaker, is if we have some support uh, from the opposition for tougher 
for tougher sentences for rapists and serious sexual offenders. What kind of a signal does it send when they won't even back tougher sentences, Mr Speaker? Here's Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister knows very well why we voted against his bill, precisely because it did more to protect statues than women. But, 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 but since, he's, since he's brought it up, Mr Speaker, let's address the central question. Prime Minister, 98.4% of reported rapes don't end up in a charge. 98.4%. And therefore, the question of sentence never arises in those cases. So he, since he's brought up the bill, it's his main defence, it seems. Can he tell me, point to what provision in the bill, what clause, what chapter, what part of that bill will do anything to change the fact that 98.4% of reported rape cases yeah. don't end in charges and don't get to sentence? Which clause, part, chapter or words in that bill? Point to one thing. Well, Mr Speaker, well, let me point to section uh, 106 and 107 uh, of that bill, uh, which, which Labour voted down, Mr Speaker, which would have, which would have stopped uh, the early release of rapists at their halfway point in their sense. What kind of a signal, what kind of a message does that send, Mr Speaker, uh, to people who commit uh, the crimes of rape? It is very, very important that the message should go out from this House of Commons that we will not tolerate a serious sexual violence. And I'm afraid that the Right Honourable Gentleman has not been supporting that message. What we are, do what we are doing now what we are doing now is bringing forward measures by investing in independent domestic violence, independent sexual violence advisors uh, to ensure that victims and survivors of the crime of rape have people in whom they can confide and trust throughout that miserable period when they're in the, when they're in the criminal justice system. And another thing we're doing, Mr Speaker, is recruiting record numbers of police officers. And I'm proud to say, and I'm proud to say, I'm proud to say that 40 per cent of our new recruits are female, Mr Speaker, which I believe will be a great, a great consolation and use to those who are victims and survivors of rape. Starmer, what an appalling answer. I asked him why 98.4 per cent of cases aren't getting into the system, and he talks about a sentence. Yeah. But, oh, you did, uh, that, that is the problem. If the Prime Minister thinks that's the answer, that is why we've got these terrible rates of conviction and of prosecution. The answer is there's nothing in that bill. The truth is, victims of rape are being failed. Now, Mr Speaker, they're not just my words. They're in the government's own report. Victims of rape are being failed. There's no escaping that appalling figure, Prime Minister. 98.4% of rape cases ending without anybody being charged. And those that do get in the system take years to go through. Does the Prime Minister accept that cuts to the criminal justice system have contributed to that appalling situation? Prime Minister. No, Mr Speaker, because we've increased the, uh, the numbers of people in the, uh, in the CPS by at least 200, Mr. Uh, specifically dedicated to uh, helping to prosecute re the crime of rape and, and sexual violence. And, and, Mr. Speaker, we are absolutely determined uh, to stamp it out. This is a problem that has been going worse because of the evidential difficulties caused by uh, the, the data recovery process and the lack of the lack of unity, the lack of joined up thinking between all parts of the criminal justice system. That is something that this government is now addressing by more investment, by putting more police out on the street, and also by having tougher sentences. And finally, it would be good to hear him support it. Keir Starmer. Mr. Speaker, I spent five years as Director of Public Prosecution prosecuting thousands of rape cases. I don't need lectures, but I do know the impact of cuts on our criminal justice, in our criminal justice service. The government can't make cuts, significant cuts, to the Crown Prosecution Service, 25% cuts to the Ministry of Justice, close half the courts in England and Wales, yes, half the courts, and now pretend that a small budget increase will solve the problem. But, Mr Speaker, this is more than just about cuts. The rape review is welcome, but it's weak. The Victims Commissioner, the government's Victims Commissioner, described the review as underwhelming, and it could have been ten times stronger. That review is littered with pilots and consultations yep. on proposals that have literally been discussed for years yep. and years. It is so unambitious. Mr Speaker, isn't it the case that despite these shameful figures, and they are shameful, 
the government still isn't showing the urgency needed yeah. to tackle the epidemic of violence against women and girls. Yeah. Minister. Uh, no, Mr Speaker, because we've also brought in the landmark domestic uh, violence bill, which, uh, I, I, again, uh, it would have been good if we'd had uh, wholehearted support from the, the Labour Party opposite. Uh, and, and, Mr Speaker, no, because uh, this government has brought in uh, much tougher sentences for serious sexual and violent offenders. And he, he can't, no matter how much he wriggles and squirms, Mr Speaker, he can't get away from the, the simple fact that on a three-line whip, he got his party to vote against tougher sentences for serious sexual and violent offenders. That, Mr Speaker, is weak. Dear Starmer. You can always tell when he's losing, Mr Speaker. <laughs> on, 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 oh, on. Oh, oh. I want both sides. It's a very, very emotive and important issue. I need to hear the question and the answers. And I certainly don't expect shouting from the back benches. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, on the Prime Minister's watch, rape, prosecution convictions are at a record low. Court backlogs are at a record high. Victims are waiting longer for justice, and criminals are getting away with it. This wasn't inevitable. It's the cost of a decade of Conservative cuts. And even now, even now, the government isn't showing the urgency and the ambition that's needed. Mr Speaker, the Justice Secretary has done the rarest of things for this government and apologised. But I note the Prime Minister hasn't done that today. It's time he did, that he took some responsibility and backed it up with, it, with action. Will he do so? Prime Minister. Speaker, the first, as, I, as I said to the right honourable gentleman, and I, and I fought uh, to have... Uh, tougher uh, action against rapists and sexual offenders throughout my time as, as Mayor of London, and of course to all the victims of, of, of rape and sexual violence, all the victims and uh, survivors, of course uh, I say sorry for the, the trauma that they have been through, the frustration uh, that they go through because of the inadequacies of the criminal justice system. We are fixing that. Uh, we're fixing that with investing, by investing another billion pounds in clearing the court backlogs, in ensuring that they have a, a people that they can listen to and trust who will help them uh, through the trials of the, uh, of the criminal justice experience, Mr Speaker. But above all, uh, we are helping them by getting our courts moving again. The fastest, most efficient way to do that, as he knows, is to get our country moving again, which is what we are doing with the fastest vaccination rollout anywhere in Europe, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, we are getting on with the job, Mr Speaker. They jabber, we jab, Mr Speaker. Speaker, they they dither, and we deliver. They vacillate, and we vaccinate, Mr. Speaker. Let's go to Craig Whitaker. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Leveling Up Fund is a superb opportunity for local areas like Calderdale Council to improve infrastructure and relieve the misery misery in local areas. With that aim, will my right honourable friend take a serious look at Calderdale's submission, which lacks support, has no consultation nor consensus with partners, and instead of relieving infrastructure problems, ploughs on with one of the council's failed and doomed projects, which does nothing at all to level up and has no support locally? Uh, I thank my honourable friend for his question, and I hope very much that I, and I think the Leveling Up Fund has the potential to do massive uh, good for, uh, for Calderdale and, and indeed the whole country. And I hope that uh, Calderdale Council will have listened uh, to his strictures uh, the, this morning and this afternoon and will act. They now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This morning, the head of newspaper revealed that in the middle of a pandemic, Tory ministers secretly directed funds from an emergency COVID contract to carry out polling on the union. This evidence was uncovered in official documents submitted to the High Court, so the Prime Minister would be well advised to be very careful in his answer to this question. And it's a very simple question. Did the UK Government use a £560,000 emergency COVID contract to conduct constitutional campaigning on the union? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm afraid I'm not aware of the, of the contract to which the right honourable gentleman refers, but what I can tell him is that I think that the uh, union 
and the benefits of the, of the union have been incalculable uh, throughout the COVID pandemic. Uh, and the, the vaccine uh, rollout, which I've just mentioned to the right honourable uh, gentleman opposite, uh, is of course something that where va vaccines have been pioneered uh, in Scotland. They've been uh, brewed in Oxford, bottled in Wales, rolled out throughout uh, the UK. And I think it's a tribute to the union that he seeks to undermine. Ian Black. The Prime Minister has just demonstrated, not for the first time, that he hasn't got a clue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the answer to the question is yes. Whether it's redecorating the Downing Street flat or siphoning off Covid funds for political campaigning, the pattern is clear. The Tories simply can't be trusted. Because, let's be very clear as to what happened here. These emergency Covid contracts were supposed to be used for things like PPE for our brave doctors and for nurses fighting COVID. Instead, during the height of this deadly pandemic, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster used these emergency contracts to commission political research, and I quote, on attitudes to the UK Union. What's worse, he handed these lucrative contracts to long-term friends and former employees. In essence, this was a UK government contract that sanctioned corrupt campaigning, Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister has even a shred of credibility, will he now commit to a full public inquiry on this gross misuse of public funds? General. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I can't think of a better use of public funds uh, than making sure that the whole of the UK fights the Covid pandemic together. Uh, and that's what we do. And, and, and thanks to the, to the UK Treasury, uh, we were able to spend £407 billion supporting jobs and families in Scotland, Mr. Peeper, Mrs Speaker. We were able to use the British Army uh, to send vaccines throughout the whole of the UK, Mr Speaker. I believe, I believe that uh, the, the story of this last two years has shown the incalculable value of our union and the strength of our union, and that we are better, Mr Speaker, together. Mark Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's groundbreaking 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution has ambitious targets for a switch to zero emission electric vehicles, and the UK's automotive manufacturers are ready to deliver, with vehicle manufacture taking place uh, close to where batteries are made because of the high proportion of an electric vehicle's cost and weight made up by the battery. Mr. Speaker, Coventry is the historic home of the car industry and the headquarters of Jaguar Land Rover, who made the car in which the Prime Minister travelled to Parliament today. So will he give his support to the proposal to build a gigafactory at Coventry Airport? Uh, well, I, have, I have fond memories of visiting my, right, on my own friend's constituency and, and uh, using an electric. Uh, taxi, uh, which they thought was impossible uh, 15 years ago, uh, Mr. Speaker, but we got it done, and we'll make sure that uh, his constituencies, constituencies across the country, are in the lead in building new electric vehicles for this country and for the world. Ed Davey. Mr. Speaker, in Chesham and Amersham, several people told me how they struggle week in, week out to care for a family loved one while trying to hold down a job. They told me they felt the Prime Minister wasn't interested in them, that he wasn't listening to them, that he didn't care about them. And Mr Speaker, such inspiring working family carers aren't unique to Chesham and Amersham. There are thousands in every constituency, no doubt in every seat across the so-called Conservative heartlands. An estimated seven million people were juggling unpaid care and jobs last year, Mr Speaker. So what is the Prime Minister going to do to make these people's lives a little bit easier. When is he going to stop taking working family carers for granted? Yeah. Well, Mrs. Big, I, I salute working family uh, carers and uh, people who uh, look after loved ones as they have done uh, throughout the, the pandemic. And what we have tried to do, as I uh, just said in my answer to the to the right honourable gentleman to look after families uh, for the last 18 months to the best of this country's ability, uh, supporting them uh, with, with furlough, with all sorts of, uh, of schemes, and in addition, putting unprecedented sums uh, into social care. Uh, but uh, I, the, there, are, there, is, there, are, there is nothing any government can do, no words that I could express that would be enough to requite the care and love that is given uh, by family carers to those they look after. Steve Double. Mr Speaker. 
Mr Speaker, we're currently experiencing a housing crisis in Cornwall where local people are being priced out of the market, whether to buy or rent, by prices being inflated due to the huge demand of people wanting to move to Cornwall to live or buy a holiday home. This is a long-standing problem, but in recent months it has become the worst it has ever been. As the Government bring forward their reforms of the planning system, can my right of friend assure me and the people in Cornwall that this will not be about building lots of homes for wealthy people to buy, but will ensure that the people of Cornwall are able to access the homes that they need. Yeah. Uh, my uh, honourable friend raises a point that has been raised repeatedly with me uh, in Cornwall, and uh, we are absolutely determined to address the, the issue in question and uh, to work with Linda Taylor, uh, the, uh, the, the leader of, uh, of uh, Cornwall Council, the, the newly Conservative. Uh, Cornwall Council uh, to, in, to ensure that we build local homes for local people so that young people growing up in Cornwall have the chance of owning their own home. Yeah. Let's go to Julie Elliott. Julie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whilst football clubs, charities, mums and dads in Sunderland and across our country were searching for that old laptop in the cupboard to give a child the data and device needed to learn during the pandemic, and lockdown. The largest company in the world was throwing brand new tech into landfill. Amazon don't pay their fair share of tax, they treat their staff badly, and now they deny internet access to our poorest children. Will the Prime Minister join me today in unequivocally condemning this appalling practice by Amazon? I was shocked and amazed to hear that uh, computers were literally being sent to landfill in the way that uh, the Honourable Lady uh, describes, and I think uh, the whole House would agree that uh, the practice is uh, bizarre and, uh, and unacceptable. One thing that we are, in, one thing that we are doing, and I, I'm sure Amazon will wish to rectify it as fast as possible, but one thing we are doing uh, to get to her, uh, her second point, Mr Speaker, is we're ensuring that uh, tech giants and other companies uh, pay their fair share of tax on their sales uh, within this country, thanks to the agreement uh, that my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, struck at the G7. Rob Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With new houses comes the need for new infrastructure, and in Aylesbury we particularly need better transport links to cope with our growing population. Will my right honourable friend therefore ensure that the Aylesbury spur of east-west rail is approved. There's a better business case than there is for HS2, and the spur has the great advantage of being the railway we do want rather than the one that we don't. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I can confirm uh, to my honourable friend that the, uh, the, the Department of Transport's review is uh, looking at the design and construction of the Aylesbury spur, but I have to caution uh, that the cost of constructing that spur is currently very high, and we need to look at the numbers to ensure that they come down. And I hope he may be helpful in that matter. Let's go to John Littleson. John. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every day the Prime Minister strengthens the case for Scottish independence. His recent trade deal sees food producers in Oakland, South Perthshire, subjected to unfair competition from low welfare Australian producers, a country where animals can be transported to slaughter for two days in the baking heat without water. So farmers joint seafood producers, musicians, and a host of other sectors who realize his Brexit assurances were substance-free hot air. But can I ask him when he's planning his next COVID-safe visit to Scotland? Please come soon. Every visit is a tonic for us and toxic for his Scottish Tory apologists. Prime Minister. I can tell my... I, I, I don't want to disappoint uh, the... Uh, honourable gentleman, but I, I am seldom away from Scotland and can't, be, can't wait to be back there as soon as possible, uh, Mr Speaker, after the, the record polls secured by uh, Scottish Conservatives at the recent, uh, at the recent election. But yet, yet again, yet again this, this abuse of Australia that has high animal welfare standards and a negative attitude to the opportunities that free trade offers this country and the people of Scotland. When is he going to stop running down Scottish agriculture and the potential of Scottish farming. The wheeler. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, join with me in thanking Derbyshire Police for their excellent work in rounding up and arresting and charging people involved in the recent incidents of stabbing, where one young man was murdered and others badly hurt. 
This murder in Swaddling Coat, a very rare event, has caused concern amongst residents, but the very swift action taken by our Derbyshire police has taken the perpetrators off the street. Clearly more police in South Derbyshire would be very much welcomed by our residents. My honourable friend is, is entirely right to raise the, uh, the appalling murder in, in Swaddling Coat, and uh, we're making sure, by the way, with our Police and Crime Bill, uh, that uh, such crimes are, are dealt with uh, in a more expeditious way with greater powers for the police. But we're also recruiting, as I say, 20,000 more police, including uh, an additional 85, she will be pleased to know, in Derbyshire. Right, let's go to Dr Philippa Whitford. Philippa. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. During the Brexit referendum, the Prime Minister promised there would be no change in the rights of EU citizens in the UK. Yet in a week's time, those without settled status will lose the right to work, rent a flat or access free health care. This government has demanded repeated grace periods during the Brexit process. So will he now finally agree to extend the deadline for EU citizens? Minister. Mr Speaker, the EU settlement scheme has been one of the great successes of our, 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 our recent uh, Brexit negotiations, and it has produced, produced 5.6 million applications already. And I, I seem to remember that we were, we were told there were only 3.2 uh, million or 3 million uh, to begin with. Uh, I think that uh, everybody knows what the deadline is. I hope people uh, will, uh, will come forward uh, and, 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 and do what 5.6 million people, uh, uh, other people have already done themselves. Sir James Davis. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Large sections of the wine near St Asaph in my constituency currently have very poor broadband connections. Topped up gigabit vouchers via community fibre partnerships have the potential to raise much of the £200,000 needed to address the situation, but there's a 24% shortfall. What can my right honourable friend do to assist my constituents stuck in this position? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank my honourable friends, and I can, I can tell him that uh, BT Openreach has recently uh, extended its offer of commercial coverage for gigabit broadband uh, to uh, services in, uh, in his area, in the, in the community that, uh, that he mentions. And, th and that is partly, Mr Speaker, because of the super deduction uh, in taxation uh, and investment that uh, we were able to, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, uh, recently announced uh, at the budget. Point tops. As a speaker, the Electoral Commission performs an important independent role in the uh, regulation of UK elections. Whether investigating dark money or simply attempts to undermine our democracy, the role is critical in ensuring public confidence in our democratic processes. Now, with this government seeking to neuter the Electoral Commission, what exactly is the Prime Minister planning that requires an attempt for his government to be able to direct the independent regulator? Uh, for the sake of brevity, Mr Speaker, I think I can say absolutely nothing. Andrew Mitchell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Has uh, my right honourable friend had a chance to review the recent announcement from the Foreign Office that Britain is to cut its support for tackling neglected tropical diseases by a staggering 95%? This will not only write off quite a considerable British taxpayer's investment in this important work, uh, but it will also mean that 280 million drugs and tablets and vaccines have to be uh, written off as well and burnt and destroyed. Does he know that the World Health Organization has said that this one act will lead to the maiming, blinding, uh, disruption of lives and death of hundreds of thousands of people? So will my right honorable friend accept and respect the statement that Mr Speaker made from his chair last Monday on June the 14th that there must be a meaningful vote in this House on this matter. Will he see if it can be brought forward before the end of term and the summer recess? And if not, uh, will he ensure that the point seven is brought back from the start of next year? Yeah. Um, Mr Speaker, there will, there will be an estimates day debate, I'm 
told by my right honourable friend, the Leader of the House, uh, on, on overseas aid. But I must say, I just don't accept the characterisation that uh, my right honourable friend, for all his expertise, for all his learning in this matter, uh, has just given of this country and our contribution to the fight against disease around the world. Uh, in spite of all the difficulties we face, we're contributing £10 billion in ODA uh, this year, in spite of the colossal expenditure that the British state has been forced to make to look after families uh, around the country, jobs and families around the country. And in, in, in addition to that, Mr Speaker, uh, we are spending £1.6 billion uh, on supporting COVAX, uh, £458 million supporting Gavi, and colleagues should remember that one in three of the, of the, of the COVAX vaccines that are, that are saving lives, uh, um, as my right honourable friend knows, saving lives around the world, one in three is the direct result of the actions of the UK government. I think the people of this country should be very proud of what we're achieving. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday was Windrush Day the 73rd anniversary of the arrival of Caribbean people from Commonwealth countries in 1948. Yet this year, it's a reminder of the appalling failure of the government's Windrush Compensation Scheme, which has been disturbingly slow and extensively bureaucratic, that at least 21 people have died while waiting for justice, and only 687 people have received any payment at all. Mr Speaker, given the repeated delays and failures of the Home Office to provide justice for the Windrush generation, does the Prime Minister now accept this scheme must be handed over to an, to an independent body to prevent prolonged suffering? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I accept the injustice that was done to the, uh, the Windrush generation uh, and I re renew the apologies on behalf of the, uh, of the Government for our share of uh, of responsibility. And yes, I do want to make sure that the compensation scheme is accelerated. And I spoke to uh, people responsible for distributing uh, that scheme uh, just the other night, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, what I also said, and what I hope the House would agree, is that I hope that the name uh, Windrush in due time will not just be associated uh, with that injustice, uh, though it was appalling, but will be associated with the amazing contribution and sacrifice and effort of the Windrush generation to this country. And that Windrush is a positive name for the people of this country. And the and that Windrush, indeed, Mr. Speaker, is regarded as the Mayflower of our country. Esther back there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When High Speed 2 was first proposed, the estimated cost was £37.5 billion. The latest estimated cost is now over £150 billion and rising fast. Is there a price at which the Prime Minister would accept that High Speed 2 is no longer value for money, or is he determined to build it irrespective of whatever the final cost will be? Wouldn't it be better to put this white elephant project out of its misery? Get rid of High Speed 2 and instead deliver High Speed Broadband, reliable one gigabit capability at a fraction of the cost to every household which would be much more useful for everyone in all our communities. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, my right honourable friend is absolutely right about the importance of gigabit uh, broadband. That's why uh, the coverage has gone up uh, just since uh, I've been Prime Minister, I think from 9% uh, of our country to, to 60% this year, and we hope to get up to 100% uh, in the course of the next few years. I can't, I can't agree with her, however, about... Uh, about HS2. This House uh, did uh, vote for it. it. It has the potential to do a massive amount of good in levelling up across the whole of the, uh, of the UK. And, and indeed, I think even the Liberal Democrats voted for it, uh, Mr Speaker. I see him there. I think he voted. I, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, think it to judge from some of their, their recent uh, campaigns, would you, Mr Speaker? But that's the thing about the Liberal Democrats, Mr Speaker. They can vote for one thing and then say another thing when it comes to elections. Let's go to Bell Ribeiro Abbey. Bell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the COVID-19 pandemic exploded, scientists warned that with the rapid transmission, more dangerous variants would emerge and vaccines could lose efficacy in the face of mutations. Now, variant upon variant has sparked surge testing, further lockdowns, and a recent delay to the end of restrictions, with 41 people already reported to have the more virulent Delta Plus variant. 
The Prime Minister held his vaccine donation as putting people squarely above profit. But this is lousy in the face of the fact that intellectual property is driving global supply shortages. So does the Prime Minister understand why it's no use for the G7 to promise a billion doses at some point in the future when people are dying now and the success of our vaccination programme is under threat from emerging variants now? And will he reconsider his negligible vaccine donation policy and join over 100 countries in supporting the vaccine? intellectual property waiver. Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I, I really think it is uh, satirical to uh, say that the, uh, the G7's efforts have so far been negligible. Uh, what uh, they agreed at Carbis Bay was another billion on, on top of the billion that have already been uh, contributed. Uh, the UK is putting in, uh, as she knows, 100 million up to, uh, another 100 million up to, to June uh, next year. And as for, the, as for the, the, the points she makes about variants, uh, and, uh, and vaccines, she should know that on the, uh, all the uh, advice that we have at present is that the vaccines are effective against uh, all the variants that we can currently see. Mr Speaker, can the Prime Minister promise that the forthcoming planning bill will not restrict the right of residents to have their say over what is built in their neighbourhood? Uh, yes, indeed, Mr Speaker. And what we want to ensure... What we want to ensure, yes, because we won't have it, I won't have this misrepresented uh, by the Liberal Democrats uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the way that they do, and, uh, and everybody will know, I won't have it misrepresented by, uh, by anybody, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, because what we want to do is to ensure that we uh, give the young people in this country the chance of home ownership, which the party opposite would ruthlessly deny them. Uh, and what we want to do, Mr Speaker, by our levelling up agenda is, is help young people across the country and make sure, by the way, that we relieve pressure on the overheating uh, South East and ensure that we build back better across the whole of the UK. And that is the objective of our planning bill.